So, hello. Uh, welcome back. If everyone's ready, let's get straight to the point and start the last uh, parallel session of today. Uh, and I will just uh, give the floor to Professor Stenetel. He needs no further introduction for this, uh, the most mysterious couple in all the presentations. Please. Thank you. Yeah, you are right. Uh, it is a bit mystifying title, uh, but indeed, uh, I picked this title to tell you something which is really very, very banal. And I think it's probably the most banal presentation I, I had ever given, uh, but it, it took me so many years to realize these banalities. I mean, sometimes it takes a long time to to see things which are just before your eyes. And I think these sheets in the wild is such a thing. Um, <clears throat> yesterday, as you may recall, I gave you a short primer of first theory of propositions in this notion of so assertion. We have, we have to share the presentation soon. Yeah, uh, please. Oh, uh, let me help you. So let's go see. screen. <laughs> Sorry. No didn't, problem. No problem. I didn't realize that. No problem. We just let's do this. Try to minimize this. Super. Just it very, very visible. Yeah. Um, so there you go. Okay. Uh, sorry for uh, missing out on the Zoom thing. Uh, I was just saying that uh, the mystifying title of this presentation really covers uh, an issue which is, uh, is so banal as to uh, bordering uh, to the insignificant, but that uh, sometimes you have to uh, wait long until you see what's, uh, what's really in front of your eyes. Um, yesterday, as uh, some of you may recall, I gave a short primer of Peirce's theory of propositions and his notion of assertion. Today, I shall uh, add an observation uh, on how propositions are presented in the wild, I mean, outside of formalized languages. I mean, here you have uh, formalized propositions uh, saying that all balls are red, uh, but uh, typically uh, this is not the way we encounter propositions uh, in semiotic real life in the wild. <coughs> uh, and uh, here, uh, in the wild, my claim was that uh, it's important that the subject part of the proposition and the predicate part of the proposition are presented in proximity uh, somehow. I call it co-localization. Uh, if they are not so presented, uh, the interpreter will not be able to fuse them into one proposition. <clears throat> uh, of course, there may, as a uh, Hers and uh, Frege before him uh, realized uh, there may be several subjects uh, connected to one and the same predicate. <clears throat> Here we have uh, another version of the uh, Andreas Achenbach uh, illustration, which Peirce referred to. And uh, that gives you the idea that co-localization may function as a sort of case grammar. Again, as you can see, uh, A. Achenbach is given as the title of the of the, uh, of the artwork here. Here, uh, following a, a convention in uh, European art, uh, the name of the artist is given one, uh, Dauthage, and down here, the printer and the publisher's names are given. And my, and my very, very banal point here is just that in order to constitute a proposition, these names have to be juxtaposed with the predicate, the predicate was, which is, of course, the, um, the uh, portrait of the German landscape painter, Achenbach. Uh, so in a certain sense, that's so banal as to escape notice, really. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, two of these four names are conventionalized. I mean, it's a convention. If you have a portrait, then the name appearing directly under the portrait is typically the name of the person portrayed, right? And uh, as I said, the name in one of the lower corners will typically be the name of the artist. So, uh, so these are sort of conventions. The other two names then are not uh, conventionalized. There's no convention 
saying that the printer should be in the lower left corner, right? And for that same reason, uh, their roles are made explicit. It says printed by blah, 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 published by blah, blah, blah. So uh, when it's not conventionalized, you have explicitly to add the role. But I would say that uh, in principle, this is a bit like what's going on in linguistic case grammar, that uh, these four names, they have different roles uh, in relation to this uh, predicate. Uh, and in a certain sense, uh, they constitute four proposition. This portrait uh, shows uh, Achenbach. This portrait was uh, drawn by Dauthage. This uh, portrait was uh, published by Eckstein, and this uh, portrait was uh, printed by Schilling. Uh, and uh, so, of course, you may synthesize all of these into one proposition, saying something like, this print was portrays Achenbach, it was drawn by Dauthage, it was published by Eckstein, and printed by Schilling. So these four names assume different roles in relation to this common predicate. Uh, so this example just goes to show that there may be uh, a number of subjects uh, um, adjoined uh, to a predicate, and these subjects may play different case roles in relation to the predicate, as it were. Um, the fact that these things occur on the same surface, uh, I think, is the Banality, which I would like to draw your attention to in this presentation. And uh, I think uh, a way to do that is referring to, to, this, uh, to this area on which they all appear as a sheet of assertion. Of course, that's a technical notion that Peirce developed in his so-called existential graphs. That was a logic formalism that Peirce developed in the late 90s, uh, early 1900s. Uh, as, a, as a, an alternative to the linear logic formalization that he developed in the 1880s. You know, Peirce was really the father of modern formal logic as we know it today. It was he who developed the syntax. Frege had the same ideas, but nobody really used his formalization. <clears throat> uh, but in this second uh, round of logic formalization, uh, Peirce had the idea that the empty sheet, the blank slate, as it were, the white page, uh, it could be conceptualized as a sheet of assertion uh, containing uh, potentially all the true propositions about the relevant universe of discourse and where conjunction and, you know, uh, saying P and Q uh, was realized very simply by just placing two, should not be two, two propositions uh, in the same area of the sheet. And my idea is now that something similar takes place in the wild. Uh, if we take a look at uh, what Peirce did with, with, uh, with the propositional logic uh, in the alpha graph version of the existential graphs, then his very, very simple basic idea was that logical conjunction uh, um, uniting two propositions by means of and uh, was simply representable by uh, placing the two, uh, placing signs of the two uh, propositions uh, in proximity of each other, like the, the R and the S here. I have uh, skewed them a little in order to show that this is not a linear formalism. Uh, they uh, do not have to, to be on the same line as in his first uh, formalization. So this complex here simply means R and S, logically speaking. Logically, uh, logical disjunction uh, R or S uh, is then represented in this way by means of negation. Uh, the ovals here represent negation. So this means it is not the case that not R and not S, uh, which is the same thing that uh, R or is so uh, that's just the you know the basic machinery of the alpha graphs uh, this is not so important just to give them the idea of what is after i mean this is the important thing in in my argument here another interesting thing here is that uh, first uh, when devising this around 1896 
Peirce also toyed with the opposite notation uh, in his so-called entitative graphs system, where this uh, sign here was to be uh, interpreted as disjunction. Uh, and uh, for a lot of reasons, uh, he ended up preferring this interpretation that uh, the juxtaposition of two propositions is equivalent to their conjunction, not to their disjunction. Of course, the dual system would also be possible, but uh, Peirce uh, left that uh, because of uh, the fact that he thought that uh, taking conjunction as the primitive uh, was the more iconic solution. And uh, that you can see from his beta graphs, uh, which is first order predicate logic, uh, which, which is based on the alpha graphs, uh, you find the same thing. You find the negation uh, circles or ovals. But here, uh, of course, as in, you do in predicate logic in general, he's interested in analyzing the interior composition of propositions. So uh, this uh, sign here in beta graphs means it is not the case that there exists somebody who does not blame somebody to somebody. So these three lines called identity lines, they refer to, uh, to uh, uh, individuals. They are sort of the subject signs here. And of course, blames to is the predicate. <clears throat> the other end of identity lines may also use to identify the individual. Uh, so, so this sign here means Adam blames Eve, which he certainly did. Uh, and uh, finally, you could add that the outermost end of a identity line uh, uh, indicates the quantification, logically speaking, so uh, of, of the relevant uh, individual. Uh, I'm not uh, going very deeply into that. Uh, just to give you the, uh, the idea that is from here, I got my idea that sheets of assertion may play an important role in science in the wild. Uh, um, and uh, first, uh, predicate logic. Uh, here, I, I, would, I would say that oftentimes in the wild, we actually find spontaneous identity lines. So it's for instance, in, in, in this uh, anatomical uh, diagram, uh, giving you uh, 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 cross cut of the of the uh, upper part of the human body, and uh, these identity lines uh, they give the names of the relevant body parts. Here you have the diaphragm, and here you have the trachea, and so on and so forth. What's it, interestingly here, of course, is not human anatomy, but the use of these lines. You can see they are sort of identity lines in the wild, as it were. And I think, uh, particularly in, in complicated uh, empirical diagrams, where it's important to identify many parts, you very often find such uh, uh, identity lines uh, in the wild. In other cases, uh, you, can, you can have the co-localization of predicate and subject without such identity lines. For instance, uh, in the Achenbach portrait that I just uh, you. Uh, and so how are such sheets in the wild defined? I mean, very often there's no, there's no borderline. I mean, this diagram doesn't have a frame or anything like that, but uh, we sort of spontaneously know that uh, all of it sort of refers to the same object, right? Uh, even if uh, there are lots of, dif dif of uh, different uh, uh, subject signs here, the trachea, the timers, and so on and so forth. We spontaneously know that uh, because it's one synthetic diagram, it refers to one and the same object. So here, a frame is, is not needed. But uh, oftentimes, uh, frames are needed in, in, in order to signal that what appears inside this frame refers to the same object. I mean, it's really as simple as that. I mean, that, that's my main point here in, in this short presentation could be indicated, uh, of course, by drawn lines or frames, could be indi indicated by uh, literal physical frames, like in uh, old paintings, could also indirectly be signaled by the similarity in font style or in design. I have some examples of that. Here, here's here's a, a, 
uh, example coming from a recent interest I had in the Danish press freedom period in the 18th century. This is a broadsheet print that was for sale and it shows uh, the execution of the guy who introduced press freedom in Denmark. It was not so popular to do things like that. So he was executed outside of Copenhagen. And here you can see his body parts being taken down after execution. Uh, but the, 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 the reason why I brought it here is that it is an example of this co-localization. Because here you have the, the image uh, medicate could be any execution, right? Uh, but uh, here you have uh, text functioning as the subject part of this uh, whole conversation because it names uh, the, the guy Strunze, who was decapitated outside of Copenhagen and indicates the date that it happened. Uh, so here you have a sort of predicate and subject. And the important thing here is, is, is that they are connected because they are given inside of the same frame. So we know that they refer to the same thing. Right? Uh, you can also take book covers. Uh, here we sort of uh, pass to the co-localization, not of predicate and subject, but the co-localization of propositions like in alpha graphs. Uh, here you have a famous book uh, from uh, recent decades. And uh, here I think the book cover functions as a sort of sheet of assertion. Uh, these uh, names are sort of labels directly attached uh, to the subject that they refer to, namely the book. So uh, these propositions uh, express uh, something like that. This book is written by J.K. Rowling and it has the title Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone and it was published by Bloomsbury. I mean, it's so banal, but uh, the fact that these uh, informations occur in the same sheet of assertion grants for us that they refer to one and the same thing which is the book in question. Uh, I have a funny example here uh, from the age of enlightenment uh, where you have false propositions at stake. That that's the original cover of uh, Spinoza's uh, famous and infamous uh, Tractatus Theologico Politicus of uh, 1670, arguably one of the most important early tracks of radical enlightenment. And uh, of course, just uh, with the Harry Potter uh, thing, uh, this uh, sheet claims the proposition. This book is a copy of the Tractatus and so on and so forth, with its long subtitle here. Uh, other signs, uh, linguistically unconnected uh, to the title, float in this same 2D space of the sheet. So, it's, so as, uh, for instance, the printer's name that's given in Swan Kunrad and the city of publication Hamburg. So uh, they made this uh, proposition and claim that this book was printed by Kunrad in Hamburg. That's a proposition to you. Both of these claims, of course, are false. Uh, Spinoza wrote in a period when there was immediate danger connected to expressing such uh, political viewpoints. Uh, I mean, he spoke for democracy and freedom of speech and things like that. Church didn't like that. Uh, so uh, he didn't wish to be persecuted like he had happened with some of his friends. Uh, so he uh, made, made the printer uh, lie on the title page. Uh, we now know uh, it's a recent research result, really, that it was really printed by one Israel de Paul in Amsterdam, uh, but uh, he considered it too dangerous to, to uh, admit that. But uh, here you, you can see, again, this 2D uh, area here functions as a sheet of assertion uh, with a number of propositions on it, some true and some false. Um, posters uh, typically constitute sheets of assertion with conjunction. Here you have a classical movie poster done with the wind and uh, implicit lines of identity connect the names of the authors here with, uh, with um, the portraits of them appearing in their roles. And the role names are also given down here. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, propositions going on here. Uh, also, uh, that it was produced by uh, Selznick. It was based by uh, the novel of Margaret Mitchell. Uh, the film is showing twice daily and so on and so forth. There's a lot of propositions here. But my point here is that uh, we know that all of these propositions 
pertain to the same movie because they are printed in the same 2D uh, sheet of assertion, as it were. So again, that's my very simple uh, claim. And I think this is my last uh, example here, going a bit into what we discussed with irony and satire uh, yesterday. It's a recent example of a political poster uh, connected to the American presidential election a year ago. Uh, you can uh, read acting in concert, uh, Putin and the Pussy Grabbers. And uh, here you have this famous band, you have uh, Donald Trump donning his Elvis costume, and you have uh, Vladimir Putin here uh, reading his guitar. And uh, here you have a lot of uh, support bands, uh, including uh, uh, Susie Q and Nun and the Roger Stones and uh, such famous banks, and uh, they are appearing on a farewell freedom to uh, uh, with the date of November the 3rd, which was of, uh, was of course the date of the American presidential election. <clears throat> and uh, of course, all of, all of these things uh, constitute false conversations. I mean, there's no such tour. The two never appeared uh, as a pop duo on stage together and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, my theoretical claim here is, is that the reason why we are able to, re to, to read this as a consistent satire, again, is that all of these false propositions appear on the same 2D surface and so are taken to refer to the same state of things as Peirce would, would call it. Uh, and uh, of course, the idea uh, uh, you easily get that uh, all of these propositions here are uh, false, uh, gives you the idea that they should prob probably be read on some other level uh, than, uh, than uh, direct reference. And uh, that that's, of course, what prompts the satirical reading of it. But my point is just that even the satirical reading presupposes that all of these propositions uh, on the surface refer to one and the same thing, namely the presidential election. Right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I th this is my very last slide, uh, because then my overall claim is that typically, uh, but not always, but typically in sheets in the wild, um, signs are uh, analyzed as conjunctions. I mean, if you have a shopping list, uh, there's a conjunction between uh, the claims that you should buy these things. I mean, if you come back to your wife or your husband uh, saying, uh, I read your, uh, the list you gave me and I bought some hot dogs, then your spouse will say, but what about the milk and the eggs and the butter? Well, I, I, I just pick one of them. I mean, you would not do that. In a shopping list, the idea is that you should buy every single item. So there's there's an there's an implicit and between these uh, words, right? So uh, I would say that is the typical one. It's not the only one. Uh, if you have uh, menus, uh, you of course know that they are typically uh, composed by disjunction. You should buy either this item or that item or that item or that item. Of course, you, if you are very hungry, you can buy all of them, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, typically uh, this is, is a, a conjunction list and this is a disjunction list. Uh, uh, and you can also find the other logical uh, relations expressed in genes uh, in the wild. For instance, implication may be uh, given by before or after pictures. Uh, of course, in, uh, in this case, there's a missing premise, namely, what was it that gave this guy his hair back? So uh, you are interested in finding this missing premise, and you can have, uh, you can have uh, notions of negation like this one. But uh, my main claim that he, even if you find such cases with disjunction and implication and uh, negation, the typical use of sheets of assertion in the wild out there is conjunction that you uh, that you uh, uh, imply without saying it, uh, the logical notion of conjunction when you try to fuse the different information of the sheet of assertion that was it
Convinced and persuaded by your mention of uh, colocalization. And it, it's occurring to me now would you say that one of the reasons for which we are so prone to uh, uh, pose incorrectly causality is because what because colocalization is such a strong meaning making criteria that. Uh, you know, we often suppose uh, ad hoc, not ad hoc, because yeah, yeah, yeah. for I, environment, environmental survival re reasons, it's uh, safe to suppose that colocalization, uh, in, in, you know, implies that two propositions are part of the same argument. Yeah, might be. I I had to reflect more upon that, but I I do see your idea. I mean, it's it's what. Sociology is used to refer to by saying that correlation is not the same thing as causation, right? Uh, because obviously predicate and subject are correlated. But there's no need to, uh, to assume there's a causality relation between them. So, uh, so of course, that, that is, is an exaggerated interpretation of such a sign to assume there's a causality relation. But I mean, whether that's a causality relation is an empirical fact. I mean, the, you have to look at the world in order to establish that. I mean, you, you cannot establish that only by use by looking at the sign, right? Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much for your talk. And I was thinking, uh, I work with a lot of designers, and it's very common among them to talk about some guest of principles. Uh, and those guest of principles are in general um, uh, conceptual organization, similarity, continuity, closure. And I was thinking, uh, if do you think that those guest of principles can be considered sheets of the session? In the phenomenal aspect, I think uh, I think you're right that the uh, graphical designers typically know this. I mean, they they uh, they may not make it the object of an explicit theory or anything like that. But I've seen all graphical, all skilled graphical designers know this. They know that if they place signs uh, with a truth value on the same surface, then it, it, it will typically amount to the conjunction of those propositions. I, I certainly think, I mean, all, all, all designers of book covers know, know that. Now, now I, I have a daughter who is a graphical designer. She's uh, designing book covers. And she has never heard about this theory, but, she, but still, she, still she knows uh, implicitly these principles. So, so I, 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 I think you are quite right that the graphic designers uh, work work by these principles. But, but, but I mean, that's just the same thing as, as to say that uh, you do not necessarily have any explicit knowledge of the grammar of your native tongue. I mean, you 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 can uh, you can speak you can speak your native tongue without explicitly uh, knowing anything about grammar, right? Uh, so I think it, it's it's a sort of the same sort of implicit knowledge there. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking to wonder whether uh, your hypothesis uh, somehow makes sense because the contents that you present in your sheets are conjunctive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an argument by examples. Or going to the female toilet and going to the main toilet that appear exactly on the same door on the same sheet uh, at the entrance of the toilet. So that's disjunctive and the same frame. So. Because the, the content is disjunctive. So the frame actually doesn't conjunct. Uh, the, the fact that the conjunctive framework was the context. But I would say, if you if you see you know the stylized man and the stylized 
woman and an arrow, you will, you, you, will, you, will, you will get the idea that the, both, both the, the toilet for men and the toilet for women is in this direction, right? Yeah, exactly. But in that, that case, you are introducing an argument that turns that content into a conjunctive content. But if you don't place the arrow and the content stays disjunctive, then that frame with the content means less sides for men and on the right side for women, even without an arrow. Yeah, but uh, but uh, why is it, why would that not be a, a conjunction? Well, because it, it implies two different pragmatic choices. Of course, uh, but uh, uh, I mean now I, I I didn't have so so much time, but in a certain sense I addressed that issue in the middle paragraph here. Uh, because I would say that in certain cases, she's exist which are neutral as to this, the distinction between conjunction and disjunction. Uh, I mean, for instance, if you if you see uh, uh, an uh, overview, uh, that my, that's my example here. If you see an overview of all university departments, uh, then it can be read as a conjunctive list saying this university consists of this department and this department and this department and this department. But uh, if you uh, read it with another habit intention, I mean, habit for actions are important as final interpretants of science and personal, uh, then you can read it as a disjunction list, namely saying, uh, I could either go to the Department of Biology or to the Department of Physics or to the Department of Philosophy or to the Department of Comparative Literature. So in a certain sense, such a list would be neutral as to the conjunction disjunction distinction. So I'm, I'm I'm certain. I mean, that's what this slide goes to show. I mean, I'm not claim, claiming that all such sheets uh, have conjunction as uh, as their basic notion. I'm just saying that typically uh, it is uh, it is uh, conjunction, but there are other possibilities. That's I mean, like the menu and the other examples too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that that could be my title here. The yes, power, historically, the power of the frame. I mean, it doesn't originate. There's a book by an interesting kid that has a dimension of painting. If you look at this room, for instance, you find the frame over there. Yeah. And I think that is very uh, easy to read in conjunctive method because that is a uh, Paintings typically don't have a yeah. frame, right? But uh, I think frames are, are pretty early. I mean, you have uh, frames in ancient Egypt, uh, right? And, uh, and you, as far as I know, it's, it's, a, it's also a sort of cross cultural thing. I mean, you have frames in China, you have frames in, in uh, the Mesoamerican culture. So, uh, so it's it's not a specifically Western thing with yeah. with frames. Yeah. Uh, but pro 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 probably they were invented independently uh, because it's uh, it's uh, it's. Well, the uh, and I think that they got more precisely modernity. Yeah, certainly. The individualization. Certainly. I think we are borrowing two minutes from the our next speaker. So we'll yeah, there are last questions, but they're really out of time. Oh. Welcome. Our next speaker is my colleague, my classmate, and my friend. Uh, please welcome Musajin Nasarui from the Politics Department at the University.
Uh, I don't know how to share my slides on Zoom. Yes. Okay, uh, hello everyone. And in this very last session, I am going to tell you some stories. So yeah, say empirical stories, or more more press, uh, more exactly, it's about uh, stories from semiotic anthropology uh, tradition, something like that. So I think I think it is good also to listen to some empirical stories after listening to some. Uh, yeah, abstract theoretical proposals. So I'm sure that my talks uh, will be more, much more easy for you. I'm sure of that. So then, uh, the title of my topic is uh, Sensorial Environmental Science, Natural Disaster, and Semiotic Transformation of Culture: The Case of the Volcanic Eruption of Mount Rapi, Indonesia. So it is this, it is a uh, uh, specific case on on my home country, Indonesia. Okay. Yeah, so the topic is uh, the entanglement of natural disaster and cultural change. And, and this study, my study is conducted from a cosmetic point of view. And that, uh, the basic idea is that uh, in relation between human and, and environment are fundamentally mediated by science. And then, as I say, that the, the case of, of my study is um, one Merapi periodic eruption and the local people interpretation to, to this periodic eruption. And especially I take uh, the dynamic interrelation between the eruption and the cultural changes uh, during the last four eruptions uh, in 1994, 2006, 2010, and last one this year, the beginning of this year. So I think I should tell you a little bit about the, the case, the full, uh, the full canoe that I'm studying. So Mount Merapi is located in, in Java Island, Indonesia. It is the most active volcano in the world. Uh, it, uh, it erupts uh, periodically every, say, four to six years, then, then big eruption every 100 years. Another scholar say that, that later eruption, uh, say, uh, oh yeah, and small eruption every two, three to five, then medium eruption every, uh, say, 15 years, and then, then big eruption every 15 years. Uh, the, the picture is, uh, as you can see, you can see in, the, in the slide, is the volcano in the state of normal condition. As you can see that in the picture that the smoke is coming out from the peak, and, and yes, this is normal panorama for the locals. And then these two pictures show in close-up style the peak of the volcano when it, when it is getting more active. And I will also say that this kind of picture or this kind of direct uh, visual uh, it, uh, style with, with the volcano in this condition is normal for the local. This is, that is not scary for them. But yeah, for me, uh, it is still scary. In, in any sense. Okay, uh, the method of my study is based on long qualitative research with, with the local communities on this volcano. And the starting point was uh, in 2010. At the time, I became a volunteer of some emergency responses during October to December 2010. And then after that, I did some ethnographic field work in, in these local communities in 2013, 2019, and this year, uh, in August this year. I, I will always there in the locations. Um, oh, the first story is about the eruption as an action of communication. 
So traditionally, uh, sensorial environmental significance, significance, signification system have uh, shaped, uh, embodied, and habitual skills of the locals in coping with the environment. This includes uh, modes of interpreting non-human behavior and environmental cues, uh, feature also ways to interpreting, uh, ways to communicate, communicating with them. Uh, the locals believe that nature is able to communicate with human and the other, the, the other way around that a human can communicate with nature. They also believe that in order to maintain the ecological balance, humans should keep communi communicating with nature. Uh, however, the communication does not happen in the form of natural language, but rather exists uh, in the form of pre-linguistic bodily and sensory communication. And at this point, then the volcanic eruption is an example of uh, communication involving human and environmental agencies, in which messages are transmitted in certain medium, such as a sound or movement or visual signs that which are shared and, and accessible to all participants. When the volcano is getting more active, the locals are used to read environmental cues to interpret the increasing activities of the volcano, such as uh, rumbling sounds on, or repeated earthquakes, and then smoke emitted from the springs, animals running down, running, running down from, from the forest, and or eagles cycling near the peak, or come ants, ants coming up uh, from the ground in large number, or, or bamboo trees uh, being cut and, and hearing loud explosion. There are some environmental cues that that uh, signify the, uh, the increasing activities of the volcano. Uh, I think it shows what Timo Maran says as as compound environmental science, in which the human and non-human animals share certain ecological codes, uh, and and in this sense, then human prediction of the eruption in some some part rely on the interpretation conducted conducted by other other organisms. So a large number uh, ants coming out from the ground, from, from the ground or, or animal running down from the forest is already action uh, interpretation uh, of these animals uh, in response to the condition of the volcano. And, and then in, 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 in the sense then human use uh, or interpret this animal behavior as the signs of the, of the eruption. Um, uh, this, this set of communication model is shared and learned and, and passed through generations and then preserved in the cultural memory of the given society. Uh, we may consider this, this is as a set of traditional ecological knowledge, uh, which is an uh, understandings, beliefs and practices that human societies develop in long periods in relationship with their natural environment. Uh, the locals uh, call this set of traditional knowledge as, as ilmu titen. This is the uh, local term. Uh, literally means uh, knowledge to recognize the pattern of relations. This is set of knowledge which is uh, uh, passed through don pass, pass through generation, then usually confirmed with everyday life, uh, and explaining how certain natural phenomenon uh, signifies another natural phenomenon and mostly based on, on indexical relations. So uh, this kind of traditional knowledge uh, can be an example of how non-symbolic signs, uh, say iconic and indexical signs, have become the basis of strong relationship between nature and culture. And I will say also that this kind of human environmental relation through non-symbolic signs will shape the cultural identity of the, of the local culture. Um, we, may, we may see two different levels of nature and culture entanglement in, in, in this case. The first level is that human and environment, environment are two different agencies uh, that are intensively communicating to one another through, through non-symbolic signs. So 
At this point, then, then the eruption draws an action of communication. When nature takes roles as a sender and then human as, as a receiver that should uh, give people give people feedback to the message uh, from the nature. This is the first level. And okay, thanks. Uh, and the second level that uh, culture and nature as a whole uh, shape the local semiosphere. Or or at this point, then, then we, we may regard this totality of, of this semiotic system as an ecosmosphere that encompass multiple worlds in different organisms, including human. So uh, for me, then, an ecosmiotic reading of semiosphere uh, will expand the understanding of semiotic space to include the agency of, of or uh, the agency and sign processes of non-human entities within the ecosystem. Okay, I think I can skip this. Uh, then let's uh, move to my second story. This is about the change, uh, the change of the local culture when they when they start to adopt a new science system and change their way to to predict and understand the eruptions. So within the local culture, uh, the science system related to the eruption plays central function for prediction and then uh, giving explanation to the, to the eruption, to the event, also deciding what action should be taken, especially during the crisis when the photon is getting more active. And this function uh, in previous periods uh, were performed by two types of science or say science system. The first one is uh, sensorial environmental science, as I have uh, briefly explained beforehand, and then the second one is magical science system. So let me tell you now about this magical science. Um, the locals believe that their environment was also inhabited by the spirits. And then they believe that the volcano was the spirit kingdom having the, the palace uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the top of the volcano. So the, the top of the volcano also the highest slopes were perceived as the as the place for the spirit and then the lower slopes is the place for human and then then uh, they also believe that humans should live in harmony with the spirits and then express their uh, their wish to live in harmony with uh, doing certain ritual traditional rituals so uh, uh, avoiding some taboo and then doing the ritual will result in the sense of security because they feel that they have become a good friends of the of the spirit kingdom, and then interestingly, then the eruption was was believed as to be ceremony conducted by the spirit. Uh, the material through thrown thrown out from the peak were, were perceived as trash from from the from the ceremony. Uh, the damage in their crops uh, was was perceived that the crops is being used by the spirit in their ceremony, and the spirit will give back the crops in better and, and more up soon after the eruptions. So, uh, in the sense, then then before the eruption, the spirit usually will send certain message uh, to people. This message called as visik. Uh, visik uh, usually is about when the eruption will happen, in which direction, and what uh, what kind of action should be taken in order to, to avoid human victims or human casualties. The, the form of physics can be dreams, uh, can be animal behaviors, or other environmental cues that can be interpreted as magical signs. Then only the caretaker of the volcano or, or, or the elders who, who consider to have inner sensitivity can, can obtain and decode this sacred symbolic science. So when the volcano is getting more active, then the, the local people uh, will, will obey to the elders who were waiting for the visit. Also at the same time, they will op, uh, observe the environmental cues uh, intensively uh, to, to interpret the activities of the volcano. No visit, no magical, message mean nothing to do, including the need to evacuate. Five minutes, okay. Um, 
Nowadays, the local consider that this kind of magical sign system has failed in performing eruption related functions. Uh, this evaluation was, um, was based on the fact that the eruption have, have many victims and, and have, have caused many losses, especially in the last three eruption. In, in 1994, it has still, it has destroyed totally one hamlet and killed uh, 69 people there in this hamlet. Also 2006 eruption has destroyed totally 100 and kills two volunteers at a time. And the last big eruption 2010 was, was, was much more bad because it has killed 386 people and destroyed some hundreds, more than 500. Then, uh, so people interpret that magical science has failed, has, has failed uh, to perform this uh, eruption related function. So then they should give, uh, they should have new science system, should adopt new science system, which is, which is scientific science system to perform the eruption related functions. Uh, I will say that this scientific science system is, uh, is a set of signification system for, to, uh, for understanding the activities of the volcano based on modern volcanology, especially through interpreting data sets uh, provided by observations made with seismic uh, deformation, geochemistry technologies or, or visual, visual observation uh, that this data gather from, from several observation posts uh, at the some location on the slope of the volcano that built by the government and operated by the government. So this scientific science system actually emphasized that only the government can explain properly the volcano, not the locals. Okay, uh, Oscar, how many, how many minutes? Three, four minutes. Okay, uh, I think I can skip this. I can later tell you about this, but then, Yes, uh, this scientific science system uh, have been developed by the Dutch colonial government in 1930s and then continued by the Indonesian government. Then, uh, however, until 1990s, uh, this kind of modern knowledge about the volcano was still foreign for the locals. They did not, any, they did not have any, lo any knowledge at all about the level of uh, the modern knowledge of, about the volcano, about the level of status of the volcano, about, uh, yeah, about any information about the volcano. Then the acceptance was started by the young people in the mid uh, of 90s. Uh, it was uh, related with the adoption of market oriented economy within the local communities in, with, which was started in 19, 1980s. I think this adoption of market-oriented economy is another story, but still closely related with my story. But I think I don't I don't have any time to tell you about this story of market-oriented system, uh, uh, market-oriented economic system in the locals. Then the broader acceptance of this modern perspective within almost all community community member happened only after 2010 eruption. This acceptance uh, was mostly due to the very, very huge size of the eruption itself, which has totally destroyed some hamlets and kills many people. Then, then, then it has changed uh, the, the common belief among the locals that their, their hamlets is safe, whatever the, ju the justification, whether the, ju the ju justification is that their hamlet is safe because protected by the spirits or their, ha their hamlet is far enough from the, from the peak. They feel now that their hamlet is not safe. So in this in this sense, then I will I will say that the first hand experience of being directly affected by the eruption was mostly important uh, was was the most important factor that led to the adoption of scientific science system. Okay, um, I still have. Uh, okay, you can take five minutes. So, uh, this spec. Mm 
then uh, though this local uh, the local perceive that that the eruption is natural phenomenon which can only be predicted by modern technological and, and scientific means uh, which is owned by by the government but does it mean that they do not they do not believe anymore that the eruption is magical even even conducted by the spirit uh, interestingly that i found that they still maintain this belief but the problem lies in communication uh, previously due to the fact that that existing communication channel were mediated by the elders who were believed to come uh, to be able to communicate with the spirit then the people people feel feel safe and confident then after the 2010 eruption people still believe that the eruption is magical event but they perceive that they are not able to communicate with the spirits anymore. Uh, a, uh, a local youth uh, answered me when, when I asked to him about this kind of medical belief. He, he, he replied to me, I believe, but I do not understand. So uh, I think it shows this, this, uh, this problem of communication. Also, then, also they, they still believe in environmental cues before the, the, the eruption. Uh, however, they feel that this kind of environmental signs are also uncertain. Uh, for example, the, the, com the, the coming of animals from, from the forest can be triggered by the lack of food, also can be triggered by forest fire, even can be triggered by, by the habit of human in giving food in some, some tourism place on, on, on this volcano. So uh, uh, then animal running down from the forest can be, can be interpreted in many ways, not only related to the eruption. So this is uncertain for them. Uh, that's uh, the, the main problem uh, through sensorial, uh, in, in sensor communication through sensorial and magical science is, is uh, communication, not the whole uh, science system itself. In this sense, then, in, the, in, this, in this sense, that magical sensorial science have become uncertain. Therefore, they may not be used anymore as as guide during the crisis. Um, okay, I think I will stop here. I, I still have uh, uh, some slides, but I will prefer to have more discussion or feedback from from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I will produce a position and ask the question right away. Um, yes. Um, so, do you think this anthropomorphization of natural relationships um, can be seen as something um, problematic? Or, on the contrary, uh, contrary to what we assume that, oh no, we should not anthropomorphize nature because we are not being objective. And if anthropomorphizing nature in the process, we actually care more about. These ecological relationships, uh, does it pay off in the end to have this uh, understanding of relationships like this? Uh, I will say that this is not this is not good. I mean, uh, I, I am not uh, happy with this statement, but what I found at the object level, I mean, empirically, that uh, the local people are getting more and more modern in the sense that they are getting more, getting more and more few, uh, close to anthropomorphism of the nature. Previously not. Previously, uh, they, they, they perceive that human is only one uh, subject within a uh, lot of subject in the environment. We should uh, we should take into account other subject, whether whether animals, whether uh, mountains, whether water. They are all subjects. And human only one subject within this ecosystem. But now this uh, the cultural changes on of the local communities have become have have, have made them becoming more and more under communism. Uh, uh, adopting a topic with some ideas. Would you say that that makes them more aware of these dangers and virtues of the place they live in? Sorry? Uh, would you say that uh, this population, mm -hmm. uh, in a way, becomes more aware? No. More concerned with their 
No, they they are becoming uh, they they are becoming uh, they are in the process of uh, taking human position in central position in the in the nature. I mean, uh, taking andro andropo must be uh, 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 taking uh, yeah anthropocentric idea. Yes. Anyone more questions, comments? Reclamation or additional professor telephone. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I would just ask, uh, in your account, is there anything lost in this tradition from uh, or in, in this transition from magic conceptualization of events to, to the scientific? Uh, what is Loss is that I, I have to 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 answer for this uh, uh, for this question. So thank you very much for the question. Then this change is about uh, also uh, the change of uh, the 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 movement from from mythical cyclical cyclical time perception towards more linear modern time of perceptions. And 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 at this point, then uh, what is uh, lost uh, fundamentally is the way the local perceive the uh, their life uh, with uh, uh, their life in totally with the environment as as something enough in their own, and now they perceive that they are not enough in their own. They, they, are, they, they need uh, a lot of uh, things from outside their, say, local ecosphere. And this is, I think, something crucial because, um, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, during a previous, a previous con uh, period, they have uh, in long time practiced what we can say as a subsistence agricultural system. In this kind of system, then, then uh, they, they, they plant a lot of uh, some crops and then also uh, they, they, they breed uh, livestock and then the, 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 uh, the harvest from the, from, the, from the field is enough uh, for, for certain harvesting period. And they feel that having food for, for one year or certain uh, seasonal uh, uh, certain uh, harvesting period is enough. That is good, uh, enough. And, then nowadays, it is related to economic uh, uh, change in the local communities. Nowadays, having uh, food for certain uh, period, period is not enough because uh, they tend they tend to be more uh, economic thinking in which, uh, in this sense, that they uh, they also need to to uh, to be able to invest for their economic condition. In the sense, then uh, uh, in the previous period, uh, period they, they perceive uh, their, their life as cyclical, normal, and then uh, crisis eruption back to normal, and then eruption again back to normal. And this then in this sense, the eruption will really uh, fundamental for them because the eruption will restore uh, the, the 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 ecosystem. So the eruption will will. Uh, restore the soil fertility and this is important for them but now these people say combines a cyclical point of view with linear modern of thinking linear thinking of of, of time so they perceive that uh, now this uh, normal and then then and then eruption crisis then growth after the eruption why because the eruption previously the eruption is uh, the eruption is the resting one resting moment for for them to let the nature to maintain the ecological balance to its own condition in in, in, in previous period uh, the eruption is blazing because the eruption will restore the soil fertility but now this the eruption is still blazing in different sense the eruption is blazing because the uh, the, the material for the eruption will give them a, a huge uh, communities the stone and sto uh, the, the, the sun and stone from the eruption is communities they can sell 
and they, they, they are rich because of this uh, mining activities. Also, then the ruins from the eruption can be tourism destination. They get rich because this tourism activities, lava tour, uh, usually called as, or eruption tour. We have time for a very brief last question. Okay. So I'll pass it to Asimovia. Yeah. It was a really fascinating topic of your last comment. Uh, I remember once I was in Sumba, and mm -hmm. uh, they told me that the people there were into buying three seasons the uh, wet season, the dry season, and the season of hunger. Mm -hmm. So, somehow, the, the fact of being without resources for a certain period of time was accepted as a cyclical thing. Yes, it's exactly, exactly what you're saying about the, the mechanical eruption. So, I wonder whether it is some, somehow part of uh, an Indonesian um, ideology, more general ideology, that of integrating, let's say, disruption or evil and political events. Uh, I will say traditional societies, yes. But unfortunately, that we are getting more modern. So something like something, uh, uh, something related to hunger is not good anymore. So we should uh, solve this problem. This is not normal. And, and then static is not normal. We should grow and grow. Thank you very much. And structure and screen. So uh -huh. our colleague, yes. 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 Ah, uh, yes, I can hear you. Juan Felipe, yes, yes, I can hear you. Super. Entonces, tienes el piso para ti. Venga. Okay, gracias. So, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Yeah, so hopefully all of you can, can be in my screen there. So, yes. So, um, well, my hope in, in, in this talk is that um, I'm going to present some ideas and I'm curious about how obvious they are to some of you or maybe not so obvious or maybe a bit controversial to what extent you would agree in some of the things that are that are uh, going to be said here. But I am going to um, depart from a Grimacian framework for semiotics, right? And try to, to reflect a little bit on perception, feedback and knowledge, basically. <clears throat> So um, one of the one there are two main purposes. One is to show that feedback is inherent to the regime of manipulation that Gamer stipulated in his semiotics. And uh, my standpoint is really from engineering. I'm an engineer and I was fascinated when I discovered Gremas and semiotics because it, it, it's like a very neat way of being able to represent the structures of, of concepts. So that's sort of my, my departing point. Um, and of course, in grabbing Greimas, I'm going to talk about the canonical narrative schema. Uh, and um, well, I'm also going to integrate some a, a very famous intellectualist account of knowledge how, right? Of knowing how to do, proposed by Stanley and Williamson. But uh, basically, the second purpose is the main purpose, right? It's a, it's about raising questions about knowledge, and I, I'm going to propose the notion of error as opposed to truth as something useful, not as the metaphysical uh, entity that we should operate with, but rather like as something useful that we that we can deploy and that is uh, very connected to adjustments in our actions. <clears throat> so let us start. So the first uh, very basic claim is to say that perception is implicit in manipulation. Greimas was very focused in action, as we know, so, um, but uh, some, I do believe that in the canonical narrative schema, we have perception in the act of sound sanction that is performed by the sender. This, I'm going to explain this because I understand that we come from different semiotics, um, semiotical frameworks. Uh, and so perception in turn is related to knowing, right? One is that perception allows us to know somehow the, and to, to a certain extent the state of affairs. 
And the other one is uh, that it's related to feeling, to sensing. And this is what one of uh, Gremas' disciples um, uh, focused on, on, on the aesthetic modality, uh, understanding this as a, as a sort of competence, that, the, the competence to feel and to make others feel, right? So well, in case um, in case you come from a different uh, semiotic school, I'm going to talk now about the canonical narrative schema, and Gremas uh, arrived at the schema from studying fairy tales, right, and taking uh, taking his uh, uh, his model, deriving his model from props uh, model. So let us take a very stereotypical example. Uh, that is the, the, this fairy tale thing. Let us say that we have a prince, and that the prince is in a quest for true love, and he wants to find true love. And of course, uh, fairy tales may, make all, all of these sorts of assumptions that are no longer culturally valid today, right? So he goes to the king, and of, of course, he knows that the king has a beautiful princess as a daughter. And then he says, well, I would very much like to marry your daughter because I'm in love with her. And then the king will say, ah, but in order to marry my daughter, you have to prove yourself worthy. So go and kill 10 beasts in the seven mountains some, someplace far away and bring me a pot full of gold, right? So of course the prince will embark in this quest and he will fight and a uh, yeah, thousand things happen. But in the end, he manages somehow to, to, to kill these beasts and, and to find the hidden pot that is full of gold. And he returns to the king. And he says, well, here you are. Yeah? And then the king is going to give him a sanction. So the king is going to say, ah, so you, you were capable. You proved yourself worthy. So here you have your, the hand of my daughter and you can join her in happily marriage, right? And uh, typical fairy tale fashion would be, and they lived happily ever after, right? Somehow that, that is uh, presupposed in many fairy tales. So um, I would like to decompose this uh, narrative schema, rather formulate the canonical narrative schema in terms of, of blocks, of processes, because that's what I like most of this actential level, that it's composed of processes, right? So basically we have first the process of manipulation. That's the core of Gremas' concept, and manipulation in, in, um, implies a communication between a sender and a receiver. So then they are going to agree somehow. The sender is going to agree to do something. Uh, the, the receiver is going to agree to do something for the sender. And thus he acquires um, a desire for a certain object, right? In this case, the object is not the princess as such, but true love, right? Um, so he acquires, in other words, an intention of action. And of course, we know that in order to, for him to, to fulfill his quest, well, he is going to need a competence. He needs uh, a knowing how to do, he needs a being able to do. So being able to do can refer to, for example, having a magical sword. And typically in fairy tales, you receive these uh, gifts from the gods, right? And you also have uh, opponents, right? This, um, I don't know, um, enemies that appear and that you have to defeat somehow. And then comes like the big moment. The big moment is the moment of performance, right? Typically, one, one will meet the most powerful enemy then, uh, the anti-subject, not necessarily, but performance in itself is action. And, and it's about, uh, it, that, is the, that was the subject's purpose. So the subject has to perform. That's what you've been preparing for. You go and you perform. And performance means somehow exerting a change in the world. Uh, but what is most important is, okay, so the prince returns to the king, and there is a judgment that takes place here, right? And this judgment is very important. It's called sanction. That's where the king, okay, so the prince goes and shows, your majesty, here you have the, the heads of the ten beasts that I was supposed to, to kill. Your majesty, here you have the pot full of gold. And then the king is going to check and say, ah, okay. So there is, there is a perception of the king as the sender and as the judge of the action of the subject, right? There is a perception going on here. So that is in the relation to the first claim. And, uh, and then the king as the sender has the power of saying, okay, you will be conjoined with my daughter or you will not be conjoined with her, right? And that means in turn, the conjunction with true love according to the narrative of the fairy tale or the disjunction in relation to true love, right? So in this case, we have a binary state and this is going to be the outcome of this process. That is more, more or less, that is at least my understanding of how Greimas formulates manipulation. 
And as we see here, I am adding something that is usually not said. It's it's trivial, but it's usually not said. It's just assumed that the sender judges somehow. Uh, but but the sender, in order to judge, needs to perceive what has happened. So okay, this is what has happened. This was what was supposed to happen. Okay, this is okay. So then you're conjoined, or no, you know you failed in your mission. So please behead this man. He's not worthy. Uh, so so that's that's a very important thing. So the next thing that I would like to show or suggest is that the canonical narrative schema can actually take the form of the feedback loop. And uh, this is important because the feedback loop is like a very basic structure from which we can understand intentional action, right? The, the kind of action uh, we do when you grab a cup of coffee or when you attend the conference this morning and you say, okay, I'm going to set my alarm clock and I'm, I'm going to arrive there on time, right? That's intentional action. So then uh, sanction then is the evaluation of the action against its conditions of satisfaction. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit better what that means, but basically that means that it's the sender's judgment, right? It's, it's this thing that um, there was a performance that took place and we need to check if the performance was properly executed or not, right? But in order to understand why we would say that the canonical narrative schema takes the form of a feedback loop, we need to think a little bit um, past the, and the, they lived happily ever after, right? It's like, okay, the prince was in a quest for true love and then now he's living with his new wife, right? And ha what happens after that, right? It, it, it's the next part of the experience of love. In other, in other terms, you have a loop there. So, okay, you have this process of first, okay, I meet you, you're beautiful, uh, I love you. And then you have to live with this person every day. And then, then maybe you have fights. He needs to learn to adjust his behavior to her. So there is this whole whole iterational process. There's, the, there's this reiterative aspect of performance, right? And these reiterative aspects appear appears also in the form of training, right? Training is often presupposed in fairy tales, like you have Hercules who has to train in order to, to defeat the stronger monster, and he trains with first with his sensei, with his coach somehow, right? I'm talking about the Walt Disney film now. He trains with his coach, and then the coach puts in front of him certain lower class enemies, and then he becomes better, and then he's ready to face the big challenge, right? So this um, there's a, a reiterative aspect to, to train to, right? Um, yeah. Okay, now I'm listening to myself. I don't know if someone activated the, their mic or not. But okay, let's continue. So then, uh, how is this thing that the canonical narrative schema has the form of the feedback loop? So before we, we, we said already, okay, we have a process of manipulation and, and Gremas imagined this process in terms of the interaction between an actant sender and an actant receiver. And then the receiver will become a subject uh, that has a quest for an object as soon as the receiver acquires an intention of action, right? So you have an, an intention of action and then you must go and you have to acquire competence knowing how to do and being able how to uh, being able to do once you have the competence you go and you perform you do whatever it was that you were supposed to do right and this is going to produce a change in the world and of course if we talk about intentional action if you if we say that you are your own act and sender and your own act and receiver then you have to perceive the outcome of your action somehow right you have to be able to know okay i did this because i wanted to achieve this intention did my action actually help me achieve it right so we rely on that perception in order for us to sanction ourselves, right? So we say, okay, um, you say, okay, so did I actually manage, I don't know, I wanted to buy a delicious chocolate cake and I went to many stores and now I'm eating the chocolate cake. Is it delicious? Can I sanction myself as having accomplished what I was supposed to do? Or I'm going to grab my cup of coffee, you know, and you somehow have the sense that you're grabbing that cup and that you're drinking from it. Uh, or maybe you don't, maybe you reach out for the cup and it's not there and you say, oh, I'm disjoined from my intention of action. But in any case, no matter what, you have sanction there. And what I like about postulating this um, feedback loop form from the canonical narrative schema 
is that it creates this microcosmos, microcosmos picture, right? I mean, Gremas studied and prop before him, they studied myths, they studied fairy tales, they studied these longer <laughs> processes of actions called fairy tales and stories. And it turns out that these stories actually map this, the, the very structure of intentional action, you know, of, of, of a minimal, smaller unit. And I think that's, that's a nice thing, you know, when you have this, this kind of matches. So then we can say, sanction is the evaluation of the action against its conditions of satisfaction. I mean, conditions of satisfaction mean I, I need to know that I actually accomplished what I needed to do. That means, okay, if I did accomplish it, I have to test it against certain conditions. Yeah, I want to drink coffee. I grab the cap. I can feel the cup in my hand. I am doing this and I am feeling the coffee pouring in my mouth, right? The prince wanted, uh, wanted love, so he has to have the experience of love with the princess as they live together, right? Mm. So that's basically the main idea. What, another neat feature of the feedback loop is that um, without committing to intellectualism about skill or about knowledge how, this is from analytic philosophy, uh, you can incorporate it in the feedback loop. And I, I, I like this fact. So uh, these uh, philosophers, Stanley and Williamson, they did like an amazing argument using cartoon and semantics to, to, to come to the conclusion, uh, well, for them, this is the conclusion, right? It has been very much debated that knowing how to do something or knowing how to F amounts to knowing that W is a way for me, the subject to F. That sounds really abstract, but we can put it in a bit um, in, in simpler terms. The classical example is Hannah knows how to ride a bicycle, right? So the idea is if you know how to ride a bicycle, I mean, it's like you're riding and as you ride, you feel like, or you're considering the proposition, yeah, this is a way to ride the bicycle, right? It would be super weird if you are doing, you're conducting an intentional action, uh, something that you're supposed to know how to do. And as you do it, it's like, yeah, I do this, but this is, this is not how it's supposed to be done, right? Then, then one would say, if that's your feeling, then you should change what you're doing. But of course, the idea is that when we do something and we acquire this as knowledge how, as the, I know how to ride a bicycle, then you entertain this pro proposition. This is a way to ride a bicycle, right? And how does this fit in the feedback loop? Well, basically, Hannah has the intention of riding a bicycle. Uh, in some cases, we can assume that she already has the competence, right? So then she's just, she's riding the bicycle. And as she rides, I don't know, she, she perceives okay, I am in balance, I am moving forward, the bicycle is moving forward, and I'm enjoying the ride, so, you know, um, yeah, this is a way for me to ride a bicycle. So, basically, th this is a way for me to ride a bicycle is the outcome of sanction. Yeah? She's sanctioning her own actions. She's saying, yeah, this is a way for me to ride. But, of course, the interesting case that Stanley and Williamson don't mention, but that I take is also presupposed in their account, is that if, Sa if Hannah is doing something wrong, then she will say, mm, gosh, no, this is not a way to, to ride. Why? Because I'm just about to fall down, right? So the, the, she has to know also when she does something you. wrong. Can you hear me? Just to remind yes, you, I can. Five minutes uh, left. Yes, great, thank you. you uh, I'm on time. If you need more time, just tell me so I can take it from the Q&A session, okay? Uh, no, five minutes will do, thank you. Okay, so please go on. Yeah. So basically that's the notion, right? Just as I need to know, I need to be able to sanction myself when I act and say, this is a way to do this. I should also be able to say, mm, this is not a way to do this, you know? So I have to be able to provide negative sanctions as well. But really the, the, the point, uh, the interesting point comes when you say, okay, but is the outcome of sanction really binary? Is it only about conjunction and disjunction? And then the engineer, and this is used in telecommunications theory, in control engineering theory, in signal processing, in every smart device you have um, at your hand. You don't think about truth or falsity. You think about error. And what you want to do is to minimize error, right? And this is perfectly consistent with active inference or with optimal control approaches to cognition. The question is, what error are you minimizing and how you are doing that minimization? Those are big questions, but error is a fundamental concept in cognition. So then we're there like, okay, where is error in the feedback loop? 
Well, very server, you would say, okay, I had my intention, I did what I had to do, I performed, I perceived my performance, and then I sanction myself based on my perception and I say, yeah, okay, this is how you ride a bicycle, or no, this is not quite you ride. I mean, I'm doing quite well, but the bicycle is, is moving, you know, I don't have quite control of it now because it's a new bicycle and I'm, I'm not so experienced riding, right? And you and we have these sort of judgments also as we perform. We, we saw a very interesting talk about uh, from a musicological standpoint, right? You're playing Bach and you say, uh, my fingers are too cold, so I feel that my, my hand is too heavy. Poor Bach, he, he must be hating me for playing him in this way, right? So you feel that, no, that, that is not a way to play Bach. And you can feel this when you're playing and you're having a bad day. Or sometimes it's like, my God, I'm in the flow. I love this, right? So this is also the sanction. Basically, the output of sanction is also an error signal, right? It's an error signal. And why do we care about error? Because... Errors allows, a, allows for adjustment. It is error and it is thanks to error that we can adjust our performance in more complex systems. We can adjust our perceptions. And in even more complex systems, we can form new intentions of actions and adjust our intention of action. Yeah. So I'm almost there. We're finishing. But then the main point is that error is not just error. It's not just a, a state of assertion of saying, yeah, you know, this is the case. You know, it's not a purely propositional state disconnected from anything else. Very importantly, degrees of error correlate to degrees of adjustment. I mean, if I feel that I'm losing control of my bicycle, then I say, mm, I need a corrective action. I grab the steer wheel in a more firm way. Or maybe I'm losing balance because I feel that I'm pe pedaling too slow. So then I need to pedal a little bit faster, right? So I can perceive specific states of my, of my action. I can perceive this error that is the output of sanction and say, this is not quite a way for me to ride a bicycle. I need to do this in order to do it better, right? That's what allows us to learn and what allows us to improve. So that's why also uh, this is an extra important factor. And this is, if you ask me, like a very Spinozian take, right? For Spinoza, it's all about maximizing your capacity of action. And what allows us to maximize your capacity of action? If you perceive an error, but you don't know what to do about it, then you're limited. The next level is knowing, OK, I, I realize that I'm losing balance, so then I am going to pedal faster, right? And I'm going to grab the, the steer wheel in a, in a more firm way. So this correlation between error and adjustments, corrective actions, that's very important. And this is my last slide. And, uh, and uh, this is like, OK, so in the end, error um, appears as a discrepancy between my intentions of action and the outcome of those actions, right? Very importantly, the last idea that I have proposed is error is not just a propositional state. It's not just an assertive state. Let's not even talk about propositions. But it, it's error is a potential for adjustment. If I know how to interpret it, if I know what to do about it, if my body knows how to do about it, this is not a purely knowledge disembodied state, but it's about taking proper action in regards to a specific error, right? And then from a more... Um, modeling perspective uh, when you talk about models you can say error is the discrepancy between the value of a variable and the actual state of a variable right what the variable uh, what i am guessing the variable is and the quality of my guess there is a discrepancy between those two right and i think this relates in my view i, I think that uh, professor sternfeld will, maybe won't agree i don't know that's a curious question but in my view i feel that this fits very neat, neatly with with Peirce's multimodal propositions i learned about this yesterday and i liked it very much but if you if you see these pictures of the mona lisa and then it's like okay uh, the assertion is this is a faithful reproduction of the Mona Lisa, right? You can read that below each, each picture. You have degrees of truth there, right? You have de degrees to which these paintings differ from. We, I could say, yeah, this first one, yeah, yeah, that's the classic one. I've seen that one. The second one, mm, she looks too young. But well, they're saying now that they found a new painting of the Mona Lisa where she's younger, maybe. And the third one is like, no, my God, she looks like Hercules, not like Mona Lisa. That can't be a faithful reproduction. So you have distances between the notion of an original between uh, X and X prime, right? The estimation of that one. 
So that's all from my part. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm very open to your questions and, and opinions and suggestions. Clap again so he can hear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do we have questions in the chat or in the audience? Or both? Oh, can you see here? Okay, I have one. Uh, I think it's uh, obvious that your perspective has some applications in cyber semiotics. So uh, the idea is that uh, how can we use this in a sense that uh, artificial intelligence is looking for this anticipatory semiosis that cannot be actually uh, replicated in machines. So can you tell us anything about cyber semiotics, anticipatory systems, and if this makes sense in your framework? Thank you. Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very big question because it has to do with implementation. What I'm talking about is sort of a high level definition of uh, intentional action based on uh, gray masses framework. I haven't been very much into cybernetic semiotics, but what I can say is that, yeah, prediction is very, very much in fashion today. Um, I, I know that there are some people here that have a lot of experience in, in uh, cognitive studies, but um, basically what I can say in relation to that it is, is that I think it is useful learning for any semiotician that, is, that wants to deal with prediction to try to program or to build their own control systems, right? To try to program your robots because, uh, yeah, everyone talks about prediction, but it's like how in terms of building blocks, how does prediction look like, right? Um, I, there, there's a work by Blake Moore, for example, where she um, explains impairments of action because she has not one feedback loop, but three feedback loops. We know that prediction is based on having an accurate model of what will happen if I do F, right? If I do this action, what is it that will happen? But of course, we, we, when we rely, when we're presupposing that my predictive model is accurate, it means that I have to have some way of adjusting this model. So that will require at least one more feedback loop. So I, in, in that regard, I can say that it's a useful practice to, to actually try to think of different configurations and feedback loops in order to implement prediction. I can, I can recommend a couple of papers. Uh, for example, Giovanni uh, Petzullo and Chisek, they have a very nice paper where they talk about prediction and, and, uh, and feedback from an active inference standpoint. And they propose this very nice multimodal model, right? Where we have proprioceptive perception, interoceptive perception, extraceptive perception. And they explain, they have a model for how we adjust our predictive blocks. And we have a lot of predictive blocks, not just one, all along distributed from our from our core processing system up to our senses, right? So um, I think that's um, that's what I could say about it. And it's a very big topic. But in other words, let us try to build our own predictive systems, uh, not just theorize about them. And let us try to nail them down in terms of comp composing processes and in terms of feedback loops, right? That's what I can say. I hope that answers a little bit the question. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, thank you. So uh, anyone else with questions? Suggestions? Wait a second. One second. Yeah, and more of a comment. Thank you very much for your talk. More of a comment. Um, I, I, I think uh, one should uh, uh, reflect about uh, including the Brumatian model, okay, the Brumatian semiotic model. With cybernetics, it's not exactly the same adjustment. But that also for the sake of applications to artificial intelligence, because uh, um, in the Gamassian model, the adjustment uh, doesn't really take place in the same way in which uh, traditional cybernetics uh, uh, describes it, uh, uh, because it's an additive adjustment, meaning that. Uh, uh, the subject uh, actually changes in the process of accomplishing the action and um, uh, reaching a new projection with the object. And we spoke, and maybe it's still there, but there is a Jack, Jack Montagny who worked exactly on uh, introducing the semiotics of the state of the subject uh, in, uh, in the Grumatian model. 
So um, this is just a, a comment, it's not a question, but uh, I, I would I think you know the, the model of greenness would be published uh, if it was uh, simply read as a cybernetic model. I, I think. Uh, hopefully, the artificial intelligence needs this kind of approaches that do not consider errors simply as shortcomings, but as opportunities for serendipity. Exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for your comment. I agree, uh, like st standard Gromasian theory does not talk about feedback as such, right? Or at, at least not that I know from the papers or the work that I've read from Gromas. Then again, what I think that is, uh, it's fun to do, it's fun to try to tend bridges between disciplines. And I think that we are, especially now that semiotics and analytic philosophy and phenomenology and a lot of this and biology are converging on cognition. It's interesting to try to build these bridges. So my attempt has been to show how, how it can, how this can be done. And as you pointed out for me, the essential point is, um, thinking only in terms of truth and false or conjunction as disjunction is really not going to do the trick if we want to explain learning. We need to consider error even from a qualitative dimension and by qualitative I mean as associated as you very well said with possibilities of action. So it's interesting of thinking of, of error as affording connection in my action space right and also also as a possibility of updating my action space. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your comment. <clears throat> We have time for maybe two or one question. Do you have anyone? I see that Amelia Lewis has her hand uh, raised up. Oh, uh, please, um, Amelia, we hear you. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I'm just, I've come from, as I think I've said before, the a background in animal behavior. And there is this huge emphasis on what they term learning theory. So it's the reward and punishment. And it's the basis for animal training, but it just seems to permeate everything in that a behavior is either rewarded or reinforced or punished. And, and this is kind of one of the reasons I found my way to biosemiotics, because it just didn't make sense. And am I kind of right in thinking that the idea of the feedback loop in the model, if I go back to your example of someone on a bike, if I was riding a bike and I felt the bike model wobble, I'd get feedback that would tell me it wouldn't punish it exactly, but it would tell me I was wobbling, I was off balance, I might need to correct it. But then mm -hmm. if you add in the concept of like purses, firstness, second and thirdness, if I was doing a comedy act and I wanted my bike to wobble for comedic purposes, for entertainment, then that would feed back and tell me I was doing the right thing. So, exactly. so that gives like this, barometer but there's got to be a thirdness there's got to be this theory that I'm thinking about what I'm doing and putting in context for me to make sense of that so that's why the reinforcement and punishment doesn't really come into it, it can on a really basic level but on a much higher level humans and really other animals are doing that kind of modeling with different layers of thought Yes, if I can comment, um, it's, a, it's a very nice analogy that you put. And, and Gilbert Ryle, the philosopher that proposed the concept of knowledge, how talks about this. So it's like, there is one thing, you can ride a bicycle and have and say, this is how you're supposed to ride a bike and feel controlled. And you're going, I don't know, as fast as you can go, 20 kilometers an hour or whatever. Uh, but what is, what is, okay, there you have a given intention of action. I am going to ride the bicycle because I want to get... Uh, from A to B, right? And what makes the entire difference in relation to the setting you propose, which is very interesting, is that your intention of action is entirely different. And of course, uh, the art and, and this high level sham of the feedback loop that I propose says like, of course, our intentions of action motivate our actions. It sounds super silly, but as you say, there you have thirdness, because intention is what is, um, well, it actually performance is mediating between the states of affairs that you desire and between the state of affairs as it is, right? So there is, certainly you have mediation, you have this person thirdness. So I would say that it fits in very nicely. And I would also say that, mm, I mean, uh, like a, a very basic feedback loop can be based on reward and punishment. But of course, um, 
we don't function only as one feedback loop. We are a myriad of loops and it's very complex to model. What is uh, the, de the devil is in the, de in the details. So when you want to explain, what about if I want to form new intentions of action? That is very proper of, of high level skill, right? So if you want to wobble and you're doing this com comic act, but you see that the public is not laughing, then you say, no, the bicycle thing isn't doing the trick. I'm just going to pour water on myself and fall down on purpose and then do something silly then you you gave up the bicycle altogether and you formed a new intention of action and this can also be derived from feedback but certainly not from only uh, one loop so that would be my reply i hope it helps a little bit and, and biology and biosemiotics seems really interesting so we can enter in dialogue and and, and keep in touch if you like <clears throat> thank you it did help thank you Opposed to our finger, the time is up. And uh, we have one more question in the chat, so maybe you can discuss that uh, later. Okay, thank you very oh, much. Uh, I guess uh, we can leave more questions. Uh, okay, very, very brief question, I guess, uh, from Professor Stemical. Uh, it was just before you sort of uh, challenged me, but uh, I think you sort of misunderstood my presentation. I was not implying uh, my. Uh, presentation to be an epistemological program. I'm not at all claiming that uh, we gain knowledge by means of conjunctions or disjunctions only. I mean, that's a ridiculous claim, uh, and I don't see why you would uh, uh, conclude that from my presentation. I, I was interested in analyzing the structure of certain signs found in the wild. That's not the same thing as an epistemological program. Of course, there are, uh, I mean, in any kind of empirical research, uh, there, there are uncertainties. In many cases, you are able to uh, state those uh, uh, uncertainties uh, precisely, uh, numerically. Uh, most uh, truths uh, are vague. Uh, in any case, all everyday truths are vague. Most scientific truths are vague. But I don't think it is helpful to address that vagueness in terms of gradation of truth, unless you have any uh, numerical assessment of what that gradation might mean. So uh, I think you're sort of confusing a logical and, uh, and uh, epistemological mathematical issue there. Just, just to clarify my, my, uh, my position here. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as a person, I'm uh, Fallibilist, which implies that I believe that all of our knowledge uh, uh, imbued with certain imprecisions, uh, hopefully we're able to improve them over time. Uh, but uh, I was just say I, I don't feel feel uh, comfortable with this uh, ridiculous uh, painting that you sort of made of my uh, my presentation. Um, just a very brief reply, if I may. Well, um, I don't know if I misunderstood something, but yesterday I did ask you an explicit question, and that is if Peirce had considered uh, more than binary values on truth, or if he would acknowledge gradation and tr of truth, and uh, your reply was negative, and you answered that he had considered a third state. And what I am saying is that I have my own reasons for thinking, I am not saying that they are yours. But I have my reasons for thinking that sometimes in some assertive states that we entertain, it is useful to think as these states as being non-binary. And, and I, I do think that it is useful to think that there are qualitative differences between them. And in some cases, when we try to talk about control systems and measure of valuables, that we have certainly error as non-binary. So um, I, I just, I enjoyed both of your presentations and the one today as well. It would be interesting to have a longer talk about this. And I know that we don't have time now, but thank you very much for your comments. Okay, I would, I would just add that uh, your binary distinction between binary and non-binary does not appear to me helpful. Hmm. Okay. That's fine. So let's thank once more uh, Juan Felipe for his presentation. And uh, yes, just a share on screen. So can people in Zoom tell me if they see anything moving in the screen?
Not only. Uh, I guess I do, yes. Okay, I will uh, transform myself into the presenter now. <laughs> uh, so give me a second. And people in Zoom can't hear me all right, right? I guess so. Let me introduce myself. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, uh, I am Oscar. I am from Mexico. I am a nerd that had to uh, renounce Mexican foods in order to study semiotics. <laughs> I'm in that process. Yeah, hard to accept. Uh, so you get the picture. Uh, and today I will just uh, want to share a very brief uh, idea, proposition uh, that occurred to me uh, as soon as I saw the topic of, of the conference. And this might be contestable, mixing Paul Ricoeur with some of the present stuff that I will be showing. But the end, the bottom line here for me is just to share my enthusiasm and my uh, my love for scientific diagrams and for animals and just uh, uh, have fun in the process. So please uh, don't overthink my slides. Uh, I would just like you to enjoy them visually because I really, really like the, the visual aspect of it. Uh, so, yes. Sorry, what? Uh, do I need a, the microphone? Yeah, you do. Some people are far away. Just to... it's okay. Okay. Well, so, it's so okay. Okay. So my title is uh, kind of a paradoxical title because it says something that might sound irreconcilable, uh, but this is not only a metaphor. It's also my proposition, hopefully an argument for today. And that proposition is that the phenomenology of sensory systems. Uh, appearances, so to speak, can actually tell us something about the way our universe really works. Uh, and by universe, we can understand by the physical regularities or habits uh, that happen in that universe. And the other way around, understanding this, uh, how the universe works, these regularities, is fundamental for explaining how we living beings perceive uh, the world in a fathomable but pragmatic way. And let's start with an example right away. Uh, too many slides, too many devices. Yes, here. Uh, so it's known that the birds, some birds or some avian species uh, navigate using the Earth's magnetic field as a reference. But the precise way in which uh, this happens was just recently found uh, in a paper published this year. Um, so it's due to a quantum reaction that occurs when magnetic fields change the spin of electrons in a type of photoreceptors called cryptocones. And this is so cool. Uh, in other words, some avian species can literally see the magnetic fields of the Earth. And this is just a, a diagram, so to speak. It's not like a real vision of the bird, uh, but this is like an approximation of how they can map in their visual space this magnetic distortion that happens in their very uh, eye nerves. Okay, so if someone can teach you something about senses and perception, according to me, uh, is our fellow colleagues, non-human animals. Um, yeah, so as I put it in my abstract, our senses are not perfect isomorphic, isomorphic representations of physical reality, but despite their subjective nature, sensations or emotional or immediate interpretants our lives primarily means we're actually emulating the relevant potentialities of its environment. And let's look at one more cute example. Uh, our colleague, the platypus. Uh, so, uh, as you know, uh, platypus has like this very special type of electroreception in its skin and in its beak. Uh, so they close their eyes and their nostrils when they're hunting this uh, dark, murky waters. And when it's uh, at night, so they can't sense uh, the whereabouts of their uh, prey, this uh, invertebrates that they eat. And well, basically, what I'm asserting with these diagrams, basically, is that the sensations iconically serve as images, diagrams, or even as metaphors of real environmental features. Uh, for instance, electromagnetic, biochemical, kinetic, and acoustic spectrums. 
as we have been telling in this conference once uh, all over, over again. So this means that perception is not exhausted by human specific senses, naturally, but amplified. That's a great word, amplified. And I'm not speaking about augmented reality here. Uh, amplified by the astonishing diversity of sensorial systems present in a human envelopment. And let's take a look at one more beautiful diagram uh, that I brought for you today. So this diagram uh, shows that basically we are, uh, as you know, for those 4 billion uh, million years, sorry, 4 billion years uh, of a living structural evolution uh, stemming from Luca, our last common universal ancestor. Uh, but this clock-like way of visualizing evolution revealed that it takes about 2 million years on average for a new species to emerge. And I'm getting to a point with this. <laughs> Uh, so these living beings, or endless forms, most beautiful as Darwin would put it, are different ways uh, to answer the same question. And that question is, how on earth uh, did affinity emerge amidst pure chance and from, from pure necessity? Put in other words, how do sensorial habits are acquired in a world where both indetermination and determination are at stake? So coming back to the Luca example, uh, let's look at the following quote that I uh, We'll share with you and read it as it is. So Luca, this common universal ancestor, does not appear to have been a simple primitive hyperthermophilic prokaryote, but rather a complex community of proto-eukaryotes, adapted to a broad range of moderate temperatures, genetically redundant, morphologically and metabolically diverse. And in biosemantic terms, for us this is relevant, uh, and zoosemantic terms as well, even because researching the origin of life is researching the origin of the ability to feel what was the first qualia ever experienced and in what ways that is relevant. Uh, so it's been a long way since this uh, prebiotic universe governed by gravity, electromagnetism and nuclear forces uh, to our world where umbelton governed by chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, photoreceptors and thermoreceptors are the law. Uh, Yeah. So coming back to the title of the presentation, uh, what can what, yeah, what can the phenomenological hermeneutics of Paul Ricoeur teach us or do for us when it comes to understanding animal perception? And the answer is a theory of mind based on metaphoric cognition. In his own words, uh, and I will read the quote again, to have an image of something is to see it in our, our mind's eye not our eyes, eyes, but in our mind's eye, uh, without the presence of the actual thing. And this is the problem in terms of a general theory of the notation or reference is for him the most appropriate approach for the philosophy of mind or for a philosophical psychology. I will get uh, to some clarifications on this, but mostly I would just want to mention that uh, I'm not an specialist in public care by any means. And most of the claims that I'm going to make uh, come from these three sources. This is a great paper that I recommend you to read, uh, The Function of Fiction in Shaping Reality, and uh, Theory of Interpretation, and The Living Metaphor. I don't know how they have been translated into other languages, but I read the Spanish versions. Uh, OK, so let's look at an example or a question that has been asked in uh, current experimental evidence in animals' perception. More examples. So a uh, heron, when it plunges its head under water to skewer a fish, it must correct for light diffraction, or sorry, light refraction. You know this. Uh, then an archerfish shooting down an insect must consider gravity and the angle for accurately uh, aiming to its target, right? And similarly, a bat, when it's attacking its prey, must account for the speed of sound in order to assess its distance. And the question is, and I'm quoting here on a paper, do animals learn these relationships or are they encoded innately and can they just adjust them as adults as they learn? And these are all open questions. And these precise uh, neurophenomenological questions were asked in a recent paper that made the latest coolest discovery in that collocation that I'm going to share in a second. They found, uh, this paper was also just published uh, 
that uh, the speed of sound is indeed inadvertently, inadvertently, sorry, or inadvertently, uh, inherently, sorry, encoded in the bad sensory system. And this means that, um, or moreover, this means that the results suggest that the bats perceive spatial relationships in terms of timing and not necessarily translate time into distance. In other words, some bats use the Doppler effect to, to, for the purposes of timing from birth. Um, yeah. So with such understanding of this uh, notion that I already uh, said about Ricoeur's Kantian notion of productive schematizing imagination, we do not need to be a bat in order to develop a rich analogical mapping of its infrasonic phenomenology um, or of its mind side, so to speak. Instead, a model-based realism of animal perception, as proposed here, aims to reveal the sensorial ways in which the world becomes meaningful to a particular living being, but also to show how species-specific meanings, like in the case of the bat, uh, are grounded on worldly relationships that are needs, sorry, that are shared by a myriad of species. So they are not the only species that echolocates. So in short, uh, either by convergent evolution or by divergent evolution, perception is our diagrammatic window to reveal the actual potentialities of the world. Uh, coming back to Ricoeur, sensory systems are interpretative, or in his word, they have a surplus of meaning. Sorry, and my brain is too limited for dealing with two computers at the same time. Yes. Uh, so if we put it into more uh, explicit terms, sensory systems can cons be considered to have a surplus of meaning in the sense that they abbreviate or abstract relevant aspects. They select certain aspects of the environment. But at the same time, they augmented them and they make this productive reference in as much they increase them. They emulate them in a very relevant way. Let's look at one more cute example. Um, what we like animals. So, um, as we know, some moles um, use their nostrils to paint this olfactory picture of the world, right? But uh, it was just found in what way this is done. So they used uh, both nostrils as a stero stereoscopic system uh, to picture their surroundings. And this basically means that they integrate uh, bilateral information similarly in the same way that we integrate uh, binocular information with our eyes. So if you plug one nostril of the mole, uh, they will just miss uh, the depth where the source of the odor is coming from. Um, so this model, coming back to the metaphor thing, uh, can be seen as a metaphor, as an image, or as a diagram that reconciles two apparently incompatible or untranslatable domains. A translation between the tridimensional space that they cannot see, uh, electromagnetically speaking, and the uh, biochemical uh, sense. So this is uh, reconciled through this, so to speak, metaphor or visual diagram. And this is precisely what moles do um, with their senses. They reconcile these two apparently incompatible uh, things. And in coming back to Peirce, uh, interpretation in as much thirdness brings together this realm of qualitative possibilities that is firstness, what could be, uh, and the realm of factual correlations in as much secondness of what is. And this interpretative mediation is not reducible to the dichotomy between mind-dependent reality and mind-independent reality. Um, because semiotics shows us that fiction in recurrent sense is not the opposite of reality, but it's, it's correlate. Uh, so semiosis is an optional mediation between the potential and the actual. And my point being here that I see this strong philosophical compatibility between Peirce and Ricoeur um, when it comes to this phenomenological hermeneutics and Peirce's phaneroscopy as a semiotic theory of experience. So this iconicity of scientific diagrams allows us to um, enrich this compatibility. And as I'm trying to do here uh, with more, one more example, yes, we can read oh, this quote by Ricoeur. Can you? Uh, I think now you can. 
So metaphors reconcile the shock produced by two incompatible ideas. They share something new about reality, a new meaningful relationship not observed before. And this is precisely what uh, scientific diagrams at some, to some extent do. For instance, uh, let's take a look at this example. Yeah. It is known that the dolphins uh, use their echolocation uh, to map underwater objects. But just recently, it was discovered that this visual information that we are seeing, like, okay, you are not seeing. Uh, no. Yes. Okay. Yes, there you go. Can you see this little humanoid form here? Well, this is an iconic translation from this uh, echolocating sound waves that uh, these researchers in this paper used in order to make this iconic translation of sound. These hydrophone recordings that they used. Uh, so they used they made they made a translation or a reconciliation between sound waves propagated through water and this tridimensional image that gives us a hint of how dolphins feel objects with their echolocation. Okay, let's look at one more super nice example. Uh, in biomimetics, uh, if we look at biomimetics in engineering terms as the mimesis proposal of a power recovery, it makes a lot of sense because mimesis is not simply reduplicating, but this creative reconstruction of reality by means of the mediation of fiction. And in this paper, uh, these engineers, what they did is to study the communication, the vibrational communication code of spiders, of some spiders, uh, to understand how they can develop soft robots uh, that can actually have this transition phase between different membranes. And it's a very complicated thing that I don't understand quite well. But the point is that understanding how spiders actually communicate through their webs, uh, spider webs can actually tell us of how to make better robots for very uh, concrete purposes. Uh, I'm heading to my conclusion here. So, but first, I just want to make this uh, reflection on uh, Umbelt diagrams and how we have come up with a long way from Good School's very cute, interesting model of the functional cycle and the tick. And we can see that this is not merely like a copy of reality or doesn't aim to be a purport of uh, a replica. But is this uh, a productive reference or reality shaping, as Riquet would say, because fiction changes reality in the sense that it both invents it and rediscovers it by the means of an iconic augmentation. And that's an awesome uh, term that, I, that Riquet uses. Uh, yeah, so we don't need to be the tick to understand the tick in many ways. And in the same way that we don't have to be uh, Franz de Waal or Thomas Nagel to understand how they are. Uh, Okay, and I wonder what Uxpil would say if he just found out that some, a bunch of researchers uh, revived, so to speak, or uh, reanimated 30 years after its cryosleep, this tardigrade. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, just awesome. Have you heard about tardigrades? This uh, micro, almost uh, microscopic animals that can just hibernate for decades. Okay. That's a very interesting fact. So my conclusion <clears throat> is basically an invitation to see beyond the human made. Uh, and by this, it's not only like a very cute uh, wishful thinking that we can be less anthropocentric or less anthropomorphic, but to really consider uh, senses, meaning, perception, and so on and so forth as an intersubjective field of inquiry uh, that is not exhausted by human perception, by no means. And well, I will just read a paragraph that I have to really read because otherwise I will just uh, not finish. So my conclusion is that this phenomenological shift from isomorphic referentiality, a copy, to the modeling capacity of perception is what makes these sensorial systems, as I said, intersubjective field for uh, sous-semiotics especially. So this is a leap from seeing images as copy or replica to images as productive fiction. And this, in turn, would allow us to outclass the famous epistemological problem of other minds, which apriorisically negates the possibility of understanding how other living beings perceive the world iconically. So this, from a pragmaticistic point of view, and my computer is dying. Oh, 
So this, from a pragmatistic point of view, is a healthy move that takes semiotics away from the relativistic stance of nominalism and other views that focus on particular mental entities that allegedly cannot be inferred by any means, um, when in fact we do. So today, uh, I meant to tell you that these sensorial systems do not merely replicate um, physical reality in some capacities, they do something far more complex and amazing and useful. Uh, they increase the envisioners or experiencers reality in order to exhibit how things would actually be. Uh, so my references were spread throughout the presentation. This is the end of it. And I hope uh, you really enjoy the diagrams as much as I do. Uh, thank you. Oh, and I have to make a disclaimer before our questions. Uh, can somebody spread this thing around? I, uh, thank you uh, to the Nordic Association of uh, Semitic Studies for the support to have this uh, student grant for coming here and uh, to this um, University of Tartu doctoral school support that brought us here in a bus and paid for uh, something. So thank you. I just have to do that disclaimer. So sorry, I think you get to yeah, your questions. Please. Okay, please. So, uh, just a brief question about uh, most of that you don't have to be about mm -hmm. in order to maybe describe or understand the bat's behavior. So, of course, you have like a pragmatic solution or alternative, but uh, I'm just wondering whether you really think that all these. Uh, fundamental problems are solved by this way. Nagel, of course, would say emphasize the limits to what we can know about what we don't have first person perspective on. And we don't have that on bats. Twixkin would say Umbat theory starts with investigating the overlapping elements of a human and an animal Umbat. And in the case of senses we don't have, the written uh, an overlap in terms of sensory channels. So it might be productive fiction, but how solid is it as knowledge? Maybe the, uh, the only thing that I can think of right now is that, uh, at least in Persian terms, uh, is this uh, the aphoristic negation of knowledge is the first problem to begin with. And if we deny uh, the possibility of understanding the first person experience of another living being, uh, therefore we are like proposing a way of research that is not even falsifiable because we already deny the possibility. Uh, of course, that's the, the point of subjectivity. Uh, so this doesn't of course solves the problem of other minds, but it uh, gets us closer and closer and closer to understanding that uh, senses are intersubjective phenomena and as knowledge, well, uh, I don't know. That's why I want to reconcile in a way um, this evidence-based diagram, uh, no, realistic, no, model-based realism, evidence-based semiotics uh, that could take us there. I don't think they are necessarily incompatible, but uh, it would be nice to ask uh, Professor uh, Nagel on the wall. <laughs> Sorry, question. And do we have anything in the chat? Uh, can someone check? Yeah, there is a, maybe you can uh, ask Amelia to ask the question aloud. Mm -hmm. So, oh, no, I don't think it's how can I stop sharing? Mm. Oh, I don't need to. Oh, no, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Amelia. Uh, uh, just as a uh, for my presentation, you asked me about uh, how uh, we can establish uh, how uh, the living organism uh, thinks or works, and what can be uh, um, certain that uh, an organism is uh, intentionally trying to uh, deceive other organisms. Mm -hmm. 
I, I didn't know I I I was not a mathematician or something but I uh, I would like to John the, the, the question back to you what uh, how do you think it could be done mm -hmm. in this sense? <laughs> Uh, it takes a thief to know a thief. Mm -hmm. It takes a mind to know a mind. Uh, and this is proved by many, many, many ethological, experimental, psychological studies, understanding the social environmental demands of many animals. And I don't think we have to, so the premise should be uh, assuming, uh, the premise should be assuming that they do have, for instance, theory of mind, that they do have, for instance, episodic memory, that they do have this and that. And from there, testing that hypothesis and disproving if they have that or not. And that's different from saying, let's see if they do have it. No, let's assume that they have it to some extent and go from there, uh, the same way that we do with humans. I don't, uh, I take for granted the fact that you have a mind and that you understand many things. I don't have to prove it, all right? <laughs> and I would challenge anyone here uh, to tell me if you have ever seen a paper or a book claiming uh, or proving evidence of consciousness in humans. Like this paper discovered that humans have consciousness. Can anyone recall something like that? Uh, maybe that's a rhetorical question, but because, well, uh, but yeah, it's, um, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you.